Never think that you cannot make a difference. One carefully placed word at the right moment. But how do you know when that moment is? By being in tune with the Spirit of God that is in your life. And it can make an eternal impact on somebody else's life. Or that moment can slip right on past. Depends on how sensitive we are, how in tune we are. I'm fully aware of the two Supreme Court decisions, or, or opinions, as they are noted, that have been handed down this past week. And we're going to be discussing the implications and our response uh, to the court's decision to ignore individual states' rights, as well as the majority vote of the people in those remaining 13 states that had clearly stated by their votes to not allow same-sex marriage within their borders. It's a very clear indication, folks, of the times we live in now. And how every true Christian, listen to me, every true Christian needs to prepare to either stand for what they believe the Bible says and to know what it says or to just go along with the new majority and say, well, okay, sirrah, whatever comes, comes, you know. I'm just going to hang on until Jesus comes. Now, in any case, the Bible warned us that this day was going to come, not to be surprised, and not to overreact. You know, many of you remember our dear friend Bob Hines. You know, Bob always watched the news, and he had a heart of prayer. And many Wednesday nights, he would come in for prayer meeting, and he would mention some other things that he had seen on the news, something he'd seen that was happening, near or far. You know, and he would be worked up over it, and sometimes, you know, he brought our attention to it, but at the same time, many times I, it gave me an opportunity to remind us what Jesus said. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be all kinds of disasters worldwide and horrifying things. Jesus said those things were going to happen. But at the same time, a Christian, a true Christian, is to keep their head when all those around them are losing theirs. We are to be light and salt. And that's what people notice. So we need to be prepared. Be here tonight. Be here next Sunday morning as we're going to be talking about these things in great detail. Nancy and I have just returned from our short 34th anniversary trip that we just kind of threw together real fast and went. But God blessed us. We had a wonderful time. We packed a lot in. And still, uh, after we went to church last Sunday morning, uh, came back to the room and I just rested the rest of the day. Watched the U.S. Open golf tournament. You know, I know there's probably not a whole lot of golf fans in here, but, you know, that was just, I like to watch the majors, the, the Masters and the U.S. Open are the two that I really like to watch. And, and it was there and I, it went right down to the wire. But like a few other uh, church members uh, uh, here, we've, we went to see the huge and wonderfully made musical production of Jonah. How many of you have got to see that, Jonah? Uh, just amazing. Nancy got startled when the sea turtle came and almost dove right into her lap. You know, and then when the whale came, I was ready. You know, put my arm around her. Don't worry, honey, I'm right here. Uh, so. Now, Jonah is a funny story, and it's meant to be. But the story of Jonah is also a very sad reflection on too many of us as God's people. You see, while we say we believe that God so loved the world, we say we believe that, right? Most of us, if we're honest, still tend to limit God's unconditional love to ourselves, our own little circle, and those people we like and agree with. And everybody else is going to get theirs in the end for not being like us. Now, yes, a few weeks ago, I did talk about the two water boys of the Bible. Who were they? I've already given you one of them. Noah and Jonah. Noah and Jonah. You know, but I didn't take this particular tact with uh, Jonah, and I'd been thinking about this, and whenever I saw it, I went, oh, of course, this is where I'm supposed to go today. Now, I'm a preacher and a pastor, the grandson of Dr. Vivian Bentley, a preacher and a pastor. Jonah was a prophet and a preacher, and he was the son of Amittai, a prophet and preacher. Now, Jonah has also become a national hero of sorts to the people of God, the people of Israel. Because nearly 800 years before Christ was born, the, lo the Lord had come and spoke to Jonah and shared something very important with him. King Jeroboam, who wasn't exactly a very godly man, Jeroboam II, 
was on the throne of Israel at the time, and the nation's territory had been gradually being reduced and eaten up by nations such as Syria and Assyria and other of God's enemies, but because the people had been letting their faith slip. Sound familiar? If we lose ground, well, their, their faith had been slipping, but the word of the Lord came to Jonah and told him to go to Jeroboam because, see, their two chief enemies, Syria and Assyria, were now at war with each other. So while they were at war with each other, he says, now is the time to strike and take back the land that we have lost. Jeroboam II thought, that sounds like a good plan. I'm going to listen to the word of the Lord. Wouldn't that be refreshing? He did. And the nation was able to take back all of their land, bringing them back to the glory days of, what, of their property uh, extension under King Solomon. Now, the Assyrians, so both these nations were godless, the Assyrians and the Assyrians. They were both godless. They were both wicked. The Assyrians were really international terrorists. And they loved nothing more than making war and slaughtering their enemies. So finally, after many years, God sent another word to Jonah. But this time, Jonah had to do more than just go and stand before the king. I mean, now you think that's enough, but he had to do more than that. He had to become a missionary himself, to take on a missionary journey himself, and deliver a message 500 miles east into the very heart of the beast that was Assyria, Nineveh, the hated enemy of God's people. Now, you know, the Lord gives me at least three messages a week to deliver to you his people here in Wayne. And there are times, though, he calls on me to arise and go and deliver his message to someone else, uh, whether it's a neighbor across the fence, whether it's someone new to Wayne or uh, to people in another city or state. And it's always best for all involved that whenever I get such a word that I arise and go. It's always best for all of us involved whenever we get the message to arise and go to go do it. Amen? All right. Sometimes some of you are called to go with me on those missions, and we're all better for having obeyed God and just gone. I'm not anxious to be swallowed by anything. The Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, it could just as well read like this. The word of the Lord came to Rick, son of Earl. Move to the town of Wayne and teach and preach my word among those people there. In 1994, it could have read J James, son of Lloyd. Go to the great nation of Russia and tell everyone you come in contact with about me, for the fields are ripe for a great harvest of souls. Several years ago, it could have read William White. Go to the great city of Berlin, Germany. For the people of that city and that nation have forgotten all about who I am, that I am the Lord their God. Today, today, it could read or it could be impressed upon your heart. Don, there is another co-worker of yours that needs to hear. And they're going to step into your office tomorrow, like that one did a few years ago. April. There will be a woman. <laughs> I like that. Did you see that? Yes, Lord. <laughs> you know, April, there will be another woman coming in this week for therapy. She not only needs me, but she needs a church family that will love her and help her to grow. To meet her needs. Zach, you may be new on the job, but the Lord has placed you in that place to be able to live a Christ-like life before those co-workers, some of them who are not very Christ-like. And they will notice. And maybe some, eventually, you will earn their ear. Philip, you come into contact with so many people. So many people. Every week that need a nudge in the right direction. Towards me. Towards this church family. The Lord may be saying. Fill your name in the blank. There's not a soul in here that God has not created. And gifted in some way. And then called to deliver his message. But here's the thing. Like Jonah, every single one of us have a Nineveh. Some place we're not going to go. 
something we, uh, my, Brother Rick, that might be your calling. That's just not mine. I just cannot go and knock on someone's door. I just can't. Whenever I'm standing in public, I'm too shy. I just can't get up and, and talk about my faith. I just can't. It's a private. My religion is a private thing. Sounds good, doesn't it? We have our Ninevehs. There are places God's called us to go we're just not going to go. Things he wants us to do that we're just not going to do. And in Jonah's case, was God wrong in telling him to go to Nineveh? No. We'll all agree, no, he's not. Of course, God is right. Jonah should have got up and gone. It's obvious. All right, so is God wrong when he asks you or me to go somewhere we don't want to go? Or do something that we don't feel comfortable doing? You know, it must have felt good to Jonah to have been used by the God of all creation. I mean, the God of the universe. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When you are actually used and there is no question about it, that was God. He used me to make a difference in somebody's life. And maybe that person was saved. Maybe they came to Christ, or you got to be a part of a Bible school, or, or you actually went on a mission trip, or, or the Lord, you felt the Lord telling you to go and talk to this person, and you did it, or the opportunity presented itself, and you were so scared, but you opened your mouth, and God used it. And you go, wow, I cannot believe God has used me. You know it felt good to Jonah whenever he was used in that way, and it led to an awesome military victory, and he was a hero, and people let him know, here comes the man of God. Here comes the prophet of God. Make way, here he comes. Now, I'm sure that he was humble enough to, please, even when we saw what we saw in the play, he was always going, not me, it's God. You know, he tried to deflect the glory to God, and that's the way we're supposed to do it. It's possible. You have been used, called by God in the past to do something, and it made, you, it made an impact. You allowed yourself to be used for God's purposes. And at one time, we did something that really mattered. And it felt so good. Something that made an eternal difference. That's the sweet spot you hear me talk about every now and then. That sweet spot that God has made us to live in whenever you're smack dab in the middle of God's will, and you're doing it, and Things are popping. Opportunities are presenting themselves. You're sharp, and God is going to you all the time and using you, giving you opportunity after opportunity. It's happened in the past. That's when life makes the most sense. It's when you're the happiest. It's when you're the most fulfilled, experiencing the joy of your salvation. That's what that is. That's what that means. You can look in, in the Scripture and say, that's, that's it. That's where I'm at. Now I understand what that means. But that was then. This is now. God's not interested in what I did in the past. He's not interested in what you did. But it was awesome. Doesn't matter. He's asking you today, what have you done for me lately? What are you doing for me now? Have I stopped your heart? Have I stopped you breathing? Have I called you home? You're still there. You're there for a purpose. Every day. God asked Jonah to go somewhere and he didn't really want to go. To deliver a message to people he did not want to deliver it. You see, the Assyrians, as I said, they're, they're brutal enemies. They had brought death and destruction to his people, to the nation of Israel, God's people, of which he was a part. He was quite positive. These people did not deserve, above all people on the planet, these people don't deserve a single opportunity to be saved. Surely God could not love these people. God, if you're like me, you're not going to love these people. Don't you see, God, who they really are? It's easy for us, especially Americans above everyone else, it's easy for us living here in the heartland of America, isn't it? Blessed by God with all of our creature comforts, no matter how bad. Some of you might think you have it in this room right now. Things that I might not even know is going on. We are still, above all, most blessed here. We listen to the news. We see all the horrors taking place in other parts of the world, like France, 
this past week, it's easy for us to judge Muslim terrorists who have attacked our own nation, uh, who are making it miserable for people, especially Christians all over the world. Uh, they've killed our people, our soldiers, and they're not, they've made a plan. They don't want to stop until America is destroyed. It's easy for us to judge those who walk into schools or churches and shoot innocent people. It's easy for us to judge them, to shake our heads. We believe, you know what, they're the refuse of society. They're the trash. Someone needs to take out the trash. They're simply evil. They're twisted people. We have no problem in judging those who riot or confront police and destroy other people's property for no other reason than to say they're protesting the latest racially motivated shooting. Even if they really don't agree with it. They're, if they're finding an opportunity. We're quite certain that God would never approve of such behavior and he will judge all people that behave in such a manner in the same way that we judge them. Because we view things the same way God does. It's easy for us to do that. It may even cross our minds, and we've talked about this on many Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, that certain dictators, certain serial killers are getting what they deserve. That's all there is to it. They deserve to die and roast in the fires of hell for all eternity. And that those who don't have the same biblical set of values that we do will all one day get what they deserve. They must either turn and view the world as I do, or they're going to burn. After all, we are a God-fearing Christian people. That's why we are so blessed above the rest of the world, and everybody better tune in, because we are right. We thank God we're not where they are, and that the Lord protects us from such fear and discomfort and terror for that very reason. We believe that God could never approve of such behavior or love any people that behave in such a manner. You know what? Jonah felt the exact same way. Lord, ask me to do anything else and I will. I will go anywhere but Nineveh. Those people don't love you like I do. Those people, they worship false gods. They're all terrorists. They're all assassins. They do not deserve your love and mercy. I can't do it. I won't do it. Ask me anything else. Find somebody else to do this thing. Nineveh was east, so Jonah headed west. You know the story. Jonah ran from God's calling on his life, which was to share God's love and mercy to a people he didn't think even deserved to hear it. And what happened? Jonah lived happily ever after. His life became miserable, didn't it? Got kind of messy. Got kind of smelly. Didn't it? It's extremely messy. It stunk. On top of that, his running from God brought misery into the lives of those around him. Nearly causing some to lose their lives. They lost a, finan a lot of financial interest. I have always felt... And I believe it's true. I believe the Bible teaches such that the most miserable people on earth are not people who don't know God, but Christians who claim they know God who are not in the middle of God's will. Because they supposedly have the Spirit of God in their lives. Those who are outside the truth, and I've heard many of you say, Brother Rick, how do they not see these decisions that they're handing down? These things that they are saying are right are so wrong. How do they not see it? The world is upside down. I said, yeah, the Bible told us that. Read Romans 1. It's all right there. Well, you see why they're blind? The scripture says, Paul mentions it several times, they don't have the Spirit of God in their lives. So they cannot see what is true. In fact, this looks stupid to them. This looks foolish to them because they are blinded. They do not have the Spirit of God in their lives. They can go on and act like nothing's wrong. Doesn't bother them. They're not under conviction. They're going right along. Why, why should they be under conviction? Until they hear the truth of the Word of God at the right moment, delivered by somebody who God has sent at the appropriate time. But Christians who know what they should be doing, know where they should be, if they're in tune with the Lord, they're the most miserable whenever they say no. Or I've got this thing to do, or I've got that thing to do. This has become more important to me at the moment. This, and sure, this is a good thing, God, that I'm doing, you know. Surely, God, you understand, don't you? Find someone else right now. The most miserable people on earth are Christians that are running from God. 
Again, God calls to every soul he creates. There are some that don't believe that, but I believe it. I believe God calls to every human heart. He calls to every soul. And in fact, the scripture says the heavens declare the glory of God. You can't look around and not see that there is a master designer, which makes you, piques your interest and start wondering more about him. No one, the scripture says, will be able to stand before God without excuse. No one. Whoever seeks any truth, God will send it to them. And there's some people in this town that are looking for the truth. And God is calling to some of you to go and give them that next bit of truth that they need to hear. And it might just be in a conversation that you're overhearing tomorrow. Maybe at the post office, maybe in a restaurant, maybe in Walmart, maybe somewhere else. It doesn't matter. You hear it, and the opportunity presents itself. If you're listening, you'll see it. How many of these opportunities pass us because we're not even in tune? Today, right now, some of you are ignoring God's further call on your life. There are countless men and women and young people today who are at one time claimed to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, but that's about as far as it went. You, you said, yes, you prayed that prayer, you came forward, you did what somebody was begging you to do or, or whatever. You said, there, I've done it. I prayed the words. I'm saved, right? And somebody says, oh, yeah, you're saved if you really meant it. Okay, I'm saved. That's it. Whew, shut it down. That was it. Jesus talks about them, too. He says, there are many people that proclaim me with their lips, but their hearts were never changed. Hearts far from me. Just saying, you know, you hear me say it. Just saying a prayer isn't going to make a difference. The heart. The heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. You can fool man, but the Lord looks at the heart. When we ignore that call to fulfill a purpose, here's the danger. We step out from underneath God's protective hand, out from underneath that umbrella. Remember that commercial years ago, the, the, the insurance company, the umbrella? You step out from underneath that, and <laughs> what can happen? You know, we step out, just like the prodigal son. And what happened to him? <laughs> oh my goodness, we don't, I don't want that. I want every opportunity in this world to not only survive, but to thrive. I want God's hand of blessing on my life. Sometimes it doesn't make sense what he's asking me to do, but I have to take, take it for granted that he has a better perspective of things than I do. I'm looking at it from the underneath. He's looking at it from on top, and he sees the big picture. That's the way it is whenever we're little children. And your dad or mom says, you need to do this. Why? Well, right now you need to trust me, son. This is what you need to do. And then later, and they can see the big picture. They know why. God created you to do so much more, to live a life with meaning. He created you to live a life to the full. John 10.10. 10. But you resist God's word and his teaching, so instead... You stumble through life, living one day at a time, from paycheck to paycheck. The little joy you have comes from looking forward to your next day off, or the next toy you're going to get to buy, or your next relationship. In the meantime, you're miserable, you're empty, all those around you have to suffer because of your disobedience to God and your moodiness. These people drift from job to job. They might start school, then they drop out, looking for a companion to travel through life with, settling for less than God's best, because they don't bother to include God in the decision-making process. Oh yeah, life from time to time is a little good. You have a few good days strung together in a row, but then it tanks all over again, and still many refuse to even consider that if they just took the Word of God seriously and turn back to Him, wow, that could really be the answer. You, see, you, you understand what I'm saying, many of you? They have a hope that things are going to get better on their own. In time, things are going to improve. A, a recent survey showed that. Whenever they asked people to, to put up uh, the colors 
on the board, uh, a blue for, for bad, yellow for hope. In their past, more of them put up blue. But whenever they're looking forward, more of them put up yellow. They were hoping for what? Better days to come. We have this hope. Things are going to get better. The majority of people actually believe that, but the definition of insanity, you've heard it, is what? Doing the same thing in the same way and hoping for a different result. But that's where the thief comes in. And who is the thief? Satan, the devil, Lucifer, whoever you want to call him. He will rob you of your hope. He will rob you of your joy. He wants to rob you of your very life. It's time to wake up. It's time to snap out of it. Jonah's life got to stinking pretty bad. He had to hit bottom. I mean, <laughs> it was pretty bad. Before he looked up in the belly of a fish. It's like the prodigal son. Where did he wake up? Pig pen. For a Jew, that was about as low as he could get. Uh, swine, that was a filthy animal, and he was in a pig pen before he would admit he was in the wrong and out of his father's will. He finally decided it's time to get up, wake up, return to his father's house. When the big fish spat Jonah up on the beach, what happened? He arose and did what God wanted him to do in the first place. He hit the ground running west. To Jonah's surprise, here's the thing. He gets to Assyria, he gets to Nineveh, he finds out conditions, economic conditions, political conditions are such in that nation from unending wars. The economy is about to go belly up. The people are fed up. The condition is right. It is ripe for another answer. When the people heard Jonah's preaching from the king on down, the whole nation repented and turned from their awful sinfulness. God already knew that. He knew the conditions were right. Did it have to make sense? It didn't have to make sense to Jonah. He was just supposed to say, yes, Lord, here am I. A few moments ago I said, April, she went, yes? <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if we all did that? We felt the Lord's prodding every morning. Hear your name. Yes, I'm ready. Where, where are we going to go? God already knows better than we. Still, sometimes we think we know best. Lord, forgive us. And we know what happened. After Jonah delivered God's message, he went on outside the city. You think, is he spiritually right now? He goes on outside the city. He sits there. He goes up on the side of the hill, and he sits there in the sun, and he's just going to wait for God's vengeance to fall on these people. I just can't wait. I, I've got a front row seat. And then it's as, as if to say, uh, yeah, sit there in comfort, the Lord causes a beautiful vine to grow up over his bald head. You know, just to, he's sitting there going, yes, I'm in God's will. Thank you, Lord. I'm ready. Send it. Bring it. And in the night... Of the 39th day, a worm came, ate that vine, it withered, sun comes up, it gets hot, it's 40th day, the whole day passes, it doesn't happen. Why? Because God had forgiven the people, they repented, they truly repented. So what does Jonah do? He complains about his personal comfort. I'm so hot, I'm miserable, I'm ready to die, plus on top of that you didn't kill him. Listen to what God said. You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not even tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from the left. It's talking about their spiritual condition. And many cattle as well. Throws the cattle in there. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And shouldn't our concerns be those of our master? A servant should know his master's heart, know what his master is concerned about. Those of you who have worked for certain jobs, I worked for some, some um, uh, masters, if that's what it comes from, employers. I knew what their concerns were after a little while, and I knew what would make them happy. And what they'd like to find whenever they came into work the next day. And I made sure those things were done before the things that I even wanted to do. 
I made sure there, what would please them, was done first. And then the next day, it was nice whenever I came in before he went home. He had some good words for me. Shouldn't our concerns be the Lord's concerns? But in America, again, what are we concerned with? It's hard. We're, we, we like our padded pews. We like our air conditioning. Where does the church thrive in the world? Where it is persecuted and where it is deprived. We have comfort. We have air. You should come to our church. You know, we've got a really nice new building and we've got nice carpet and everything and it's comfortable and we have, we have screens. We make it easy, you know. We don't even, you don't even have to pick up a book anymore. You don't even have to bring your Bible, you know, because we got the scriptures right up there. We got everything. We have some people that know a little bit about singing and all that, you know. We'll make it easy for you. Come on. God was telling Jonah that he seemed more concerned with, a, with his comfort than he did with a mission of mercy that would make a difference on the lives of thousands of people. Kind of puts things in perspective. Our personal comfort, our prejudices, our hatred causes us to be concerned about mainly what affects us directly, or at least what we think does. But let me tell you, what happens in other places, like what we're seeing even this week, is going to come home, and it's going to affect us right here. I can come and let the preacher tell me what I need to, to know. I can come even if I'm really more concerned. I can come on, on Sunday morning to Sunday school and get another dose, and I'll remember it whenever the time comes. No, you won't. Not unless you're doing this on your own. Not unless you're doing it on your own. That's when it sinks in. And then whenever the time comes, and the time is coming, as we've said again and again, as I've been saying for 10 years, we always thought it was going to be down the road in our children, in our grandchildren's lives. It's here. It's here. You and I are going to be on the front lines, in fact, sooner than we know it. We've already got one, one of the, the justices saying, uh, yeah, they're, we're coming for the churches now. I mean, with the ruling, we just, it's not that he agreed with it. He says, but no, it's inevitable that the next result is the churches of America are going to have to pay for standing against this rule. Lose our tax-exempt status, lose our freedom from what we can say from the pulpit. Those things are coming, and they're coming in our lifetimes. So we need to say, yes, Lord, here am I. Teach me everything I need to know. I've got to be ready. I don't want to stand with my mouth open going, I've heard the answer to this somewhere. I wish I could tell you. Put it in here. Get it in here. One of the th signs I'm going to put up here on the, on the board outside here is they can have my Bible when they pry it from my mind and from my heart. They can take this. Other countries have taken it. They've piled them up. They've burned them. They've shredded them. But they can't take it from here and here. How much of it do you know? How about you? What's your Nineveh? How much longer are you going to wait to admit you've been resisting God's further purpose on your life? The Lord has described some of you to a T this morning. You can't deny it. He saved you for far more than just coming to church once or twice a week. Just, than to just go out and eke out a living. He saved you for more than that. There's a song by Casting Crowns. We heard one of their songs this morning. It says, you were made to do more than just survive. You were made to thrive. Pray with me. I'm going to ask Ryan if he would come. I would that tomorrow morning and every morning from here on, whenever you get up, you pray a prayer like this, Lord, what do you have in store for me today? For us, me and you, wherever you lead, Lord, I'm going to go. You've shown me you know what's best. You see the big picture, and you have promised to go with me. We have to get something in our minds. God loves all people. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. 
He loves the Muslim just as much as he loves the Christian. And he's given us the word to share. Sometimes to go where we don't want to go. Sometimes to to lift up our voice when we don't feel like it or we don't think we have the ability. But the Lord has promised, I will go with you. I am in you. You either believe it or you don't. We can't mess it up if we decide we're going to stand for him. Lord, have mercy on us and help us to live as shining lights in a dark world, to be salt in a decaying world, right here where you've placed us. Let us be faithful where you've placed us, Father, right here in our community. Let us show that we really are concerned by getting into your word, Father, and listening as you speak to us personally, not just from a pulpit on Sunday morning, but directly from your word to our ears. In your son Jesus' name.